Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this evening of Music and Philosophy, organized by the Forum for European Philosophy. Uh, so you should have the program of what we do usually, that is uh, events open to the wider public where we have philosophical debates between philosophers and people from different disciplines, and tonight it's music and philosophy. So we are extremely happy and grateful to have here tonight Nimrod Borenstein, who is a well-known composer, um, and I must say I fell in love with his music a while ago, and uh, I was extremely happy that he accepted our invitation tonight to talk about the uh, creative process, how a composition takes, uh, develops itself from uh, some ideas and then the process and then the sense that you have reached a point which is the absolute. And so, uh, shall I go through uh, Nimrod's uh, works? I mean, I mean, he has uh, already uh, composed a lot with very uh, famous uh, interpreters and uh, people who really um, promote his music, like um, Vladimir Ashkenazi, for instance, and other, other people. So it's absolutely wonderful to have you tonight. Um, Nimrod trained as a violinist first, but then he moved to composition. So, and he has already composed five concertos. And the music tonight will come from a series called Songs Without Words. And this is a, a process, a, a series of composition. And uh, so we will hear an extract from th this series. Our philosopher tonight is, I don't need to introduce you because I think he's among <laughs> the most uh, well, famous philosophers in Britain today, Adrian Moore. And uh, the, the idea of a discussion with him and Nimrod came from his book uh, the, called Points of View, which is an exploration of uh, the ideas we have about the absolute and all the confusions around it. But um, it's one book published in 1997, and uh, his one of his well-known books is about Kant, Noble in Reason, Infinite in Faculty. And the major uh, work by Adrian is his uh, Evolution of Modern Metaphysics, published in 2012. And you might have heard him on the BBC radio uh, talking about the infinite recently. And we have a pianist tonight who will play the piece by Nimrod, Clelia Iruzun. And I think we, you have a special connection with uh, Nimrod playing his work and knowing him really very well. So we are very grateful you could play tonight. So the evening will be first a short introduction by Nimrod about his piece, and then the concert, the short concert, and then a try of we will try to explore uh, the process, the creative process that le led to this piece, and a few questions from the public about the piece, and then Adrian will start the interview. <laughs> questions about the composer's idea of the absolute and all the maybe confusions or illusions about it, so and there will be a dialogue between the two, and then we'll take questions from the public, from the, from you, from the audience. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to check if, can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to be invited here. It's fantastic to do a talk with Adrian, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity and um, I will let you know very quickly um, about what's going to happen in the talk uh, before we start to play the piece. So the piece that I've chosen is a five minute piece so that offers a microcosm um, of the process. 
Um, and the main question before um, we start the talk proper is why this lecture is called the absolute. And this piece that you're going to hear played is five minutes long, but it took me about 90 or 100 hours to write it. So why would I spend 100 hours writing a piece that is five minutes if I didn't look for something that was perfect? <laughs> so first we are going to hear the piece and then I will show you examples of things that I decided that were not perfect enough.
So this is the piece. And now I'm going to uh, talk about three points about absolute. The first one is the absolute of the seed, which is like the first idea, the beginning of a piece. The second one is the absolute of um, the development. And the third one is the absolute of the place, you could say, where a motif or something is. So to start with, the seed. So before I start to write a piece, um, for me, music is totally abstract. So it's not that I think about a little story about what I did in the holiday or how lovely it was to, to see a painting or something like that. It's purely abstract, but I've got uh, an idea of what I want to do. Uh, for in this case, um, I was in the process of writing a lot of etudes for piano. Um, after I, um, I always loved Chopin studies, uh, 24 etudes, and I wanted to do the same. I think that is one of the, the only person that I've written has written 24 amazing etudes. So my idea is to write 24 etudes, and I, I started to do that. And then I had a friend that is a great um, Italian pianist, Roberto Proceda, that asked me to write for him a piece that had something to do with Mendelssohn. Now, why that? Because the poor man, or I shouldn't say that, has just recorded all Mendelssohn for Decca. And now everybody was asking him any place in the world to say, well, could you please play Mendelssohn? And he said, yes, but there is also something. No, Mendelssohn is nice. So he thought that maybe if he could play a piece that was not Mendelssohn, but had something to do with Mendelssohn, that would be nice. So I said to him, um, yes, but I don't want to do a pastiche. Uh, and um, I really loved the song Without Words by Mendelssohn. And as I did etudes, which are sort of very brilliant pieces, I think that it would be interesting for me to try to do a few pieces that are very lyrical. And that's the first of them. And at the moment, it's the only one of them because it was uh, the first performance was in November in uh, Greece. Um, so having said that, so I sit at uh, my desk and I say to myself, well, actually, uh, I want to compose a piece that is beautiful and it's lyrical and it's dreamy. And um, so what should I do? Uh, and I try two different versions. First, I try the first one. So if Clayla, you could play the first example. And I think, mm, okay, good. Mm, let's try a second time. And I think. Nice. <laughs> um, I go on, I drink a bit of coffee. Uh, and I try to imagine it in my head again. But I think <clears throat> maybe I should try something else. And um, so the reason is that for the second one, I thought it was too sweet. It was very nice, but it was just too sweet. Uh, so it's like one of these. Uh, Hollywood movies where everybody is nice. Uh, so uh, on the first one, I thought it was a bit repetitive. But what that in common, that they were establishing so, some type of pattern underneath, and then there was going to be a beautiful voice. So I think, okay, let's start from scratch, and I come with something else. So it's uh, example three. That is our beast that you rem remember from when she played it earlier. Now, it sounds very simple like that because you think, okay, there are five notes that repeat each other and there are 
all equal, simple. But it's not as simple as that because we are in a, uh, a three bits per bar uh, piece and each of these nodes is three quarter of a bit, which means that you would have four three quarter of a bit in a bar plus the fifth knot being three quarter of the next bar, and then it moves on, so it doesn't stay at the same place. So the rhythm is very complex, uh, and on top of that, so you establish something that seems to be very stable, but actually isn't. And then the thing that is very stable, that is the melody that comes on top of it afterwards, doesn't appear stable because when you listen to it first time, you assume that that is the beat. Um, so I was pleased about that. So the next step is, uh, and I will sort of uh, cut it short so that you don't hear all the shouts on the drinks of coffee and things like that, uh, and uh, coming to talk to my wife and saying how awful the life of a composer. But um, anyway, so I let Clelia play sort of up to the next stage of the piece. So that's example 3C. So it's so, so 3C. So it's, it's basically I add this idea and it's, uh, the beginning of the piece. Not, not 3B, sorry. 3B, sorry. My fault. Now I just realized that I forgot to tell you something. <laughs> I'm sure Adrian is very aware of that. That is um, actually, is I was telling you earlier that I was going to talk about three things, three absolutes. And the first one is absolute of the seed. And the seed was this first idea, or we could say even the first few bars of that. Uh, and it is an absolute because if you think about um, the greatest composers of all times, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, they didn't write only great pieces. Some pieces are less great. So what explains that is that if the seed or the beginning of the piece is not great, the rest cannot have be a great piece. And what doesn't change, that a great composer will always develop to the best that he can, but if the essence, the beginning of the piece is not great, it's basically sort of uh, on, people can talk about motifs, about tune, about whatever, but so basically the first four seconds, it's, uh, well, it's like sort of when you fall in love, it has to be the first impression that you get in a way. So, and this is what I chose out of the three that we, I showed you, the third one was one that I thought worked for me. Now, when you've done that, but it's still part of the, the absolute of the seed, you can sort of uh, refine the seed. Uh, and that's what we are going to do in uh, our next example. Uh, so there was one bit at the end of, uh, of this example that if, um, can you play the example 3C? <laughs> that I found, for example, that it was too empty. So it's a short example so that you can see what uh, I mean. So, so I changed it to... So lots of things happening practically. The first thing is that I add a middle voice that is faster. And because it's faster, it makes the main voice feel slower. And then I add bigger chords and I add something that uh, is more minor and creates tension. So there's more variety. Um, so that is an example of what I could do with the seed. I've done 
hundreds of changes up to that. I give you just one so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Um, and now I'm going to ask Adrian if he wants to <laughs> ask me questions. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I should begin by doing what you did at the beginning, which is thanking um, Catherine very much for the invitation to participate in this event. Um, a wonderful opportunity to, to talk to um, a, a great composer about the composing process. Um, and we've just had a, a, a glimpse of uh, the 100 hours that, that went into the composition of this uh, five-minute piece. Um, actually, the phenomenon is not unfamiliar to, to philosophers. I, I mean, I think it's familiar to people in all walks of life. Um, but I was reminded when you made that point of um, a famous quotation from the preface to uh, Kant's great philosophical work, the um, a Critique of Pure Reason. Um, in my opinion, not only his greatest work, but probably the greatest philosophical work of all time. Um, but in the preface, he said, and it's a great fat book, and he, he said that um, he apologized to his readers for the fact that the book was so long. I'm sorry, he said, I didn't have time to make it shorter. <laughs> um, and and it, it, it illustrates the, the same point. Um, obviously, um, a lot of creative effort goes into condensing something to the point where it's right. And it's that idea of rightness, I think, that we're, that we're getting at this evening and, and which uh, you've, you've illustrated. Um, I have a number of questions that I'd like to put to Nimrod. I won't put them all at once, but I'll perhaps begin with a couple and then we'll see how the, the conversation goes. And in due course, um, hope that there'll be an opportunity for you to participate as well. Um, but I wouldn't be true to my calling as a philosopher if I didn't begin by putting the obvious philosophical question, which is what, what do you mean by the absolute? Um, and I mean, it's tedious, I know, when philosophers always kick off every discussion with, with that sort of question. But I think it is pertinent in this context to think about the different sorts of things that, that might be meant by the absolute. And in particular, um, I was... Um, reminded of, of the significance of that question by the the third of the three stages that you mentioned in, in this sort of three-step process. Um, you began by uh, talking about the basic seed that, that must be there in the be uh, right from the beginning, which the composer is working with. Um, and then the second stage in the process is the development of that seed. And that was largely, I suppose, what you were illustrating with these examples this evening. Um, but you did also mention a third stage in the process, which is the... Um, well, this is how I understand it, and if you can correct me if I'm wrong. You can correct me if this is not what you had in mind. But it sounded as if what you would were interested in in that third stage are, as it were, those final decisions about what goes where, the, 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 the positioning, the structure of the thing. Um, and uh, that um, struck me as interesting in the context of this particular discussion because it suggested to me the significance of context. Um, which in turn suggests a kind of non-absolute, you know, as it were, the same thing might be perfect if it's positioned in this context, but quite inappropriate if it occurs in this other context. Um, and and uh, you may say, well, that's, that's quite right. It's just an illustration of how the absolute contains the relative or can contain the relative. Um, so that's one question that I'd be interested to, to hear you say some more about. And another question, by the way, we've, we've been cheating. We've been having this conversation all afternoon. So um, Nimrod is... is uh, oh, now I'm tired. Of, he's used to it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so Nimrod knows what's coming next, uh, and I have some sense of what he's going to say in response. But the, the other thing that, that I'd be interested to hear some more about is the relationship between... Um, the, the first stage in the process and the second stage. So we have the seed and we have the development. And you made this very interesting point that um, even the great 
composers don't produce exclusively great works. They, they, have, their, they have their off days, um, if we can put it that way. Um, and sometimes the, the, the seed that they're working with may not be as perfect as it is in other cases. Um, nevertheless, it sounded from what you were saying as if even in such cases, the sheer fact that it's such a great composer means that the development will be true to the seed. The, the second stage of the process will have, um, as it were, relative absoluteness. It'll, it'll it's not exactly like that, because for me, hmm. the seed is continuous, like our existence hmm. is continuous. So um, f the difference is that uh, when you are free, until, if you go to the total absolute of it, you are free until you've put three notes down. When you've put three notes, then the fourth is not free if you want to get to the only solution. Mm. Uh, so it's why, in some sense, for me, the seed is so difficult because it's, um, it's something that relies entirely on something uh, magical that you don't know. I've been composing since I'm six years old. Uh, and I'm not going to say how old I'm, I am now, but uh, a while ago, uh, and uh, the white page is always frightening because, because of exactly that, that I know that Mozart composed works that were not great, mm. and it will happen to me, and I don't want it, <laughs> but logically, uh, it's frightening, and when I've got the first few notes, mm. after that, it's like I'm looking for something that is somewhere, and I should just find it. Yeah. But I'm a non-believer, I don't believe in God. But I, like we were talking earlier, mm. uh, I was saying that it's an, an, an interesting that in terms of semantic, that we all look, always uh, talk about in terms of creation, that the people are, are, have created uh, this painting. Of, uh, and um, this word, for me, comes straight from the idea of God. God created the world or, or something like that. And, and as, a, um, as a composer, I create in the same sense uh, that, um, that I try to, to do something that is perfect, not imperfect in the sense that it's beautiful mm. or that uh, it's uh, uh, something or something else, in, but in the sense that it couldn't be otherwise mm. in some way. Uh, so maybe that's uh... yeah, but, but but this is this is very interesting because still that gives me the possibility to put the the question that I'm keen to put to you, and it is something that we that we discussed earlier this afternoon. We have these examples of of great composers where, for one reason or another, we might want to say that the original seed is not an example of them at their greatest. I mean, this this is not Beethoven's best work. This is not Mozart's best work. Nevertheless, given that seed, there is this sense of inexorability about the, the, the process that then follows from that in the, the development of the seed. And because they're great composers, they're, they're, in, they're in control. They, they, can, they can follow the, the, the seed where it's leading, or they can follow but the... you know what? Sorry, can I just... Oh, but so but so the, 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 the question is, why... Um, and, and, and I know you've got something to say about this, as, as it were, why, it, why it's always that way round? So earlier this afternoon, I asked Nimrod the question, okay, so are there examples of composers where it's the other way round? The seed is the seed of an absolutely great idea, but the composer is maybe not first rate and doesn't, hasn't, managed to follow that development in the way that the truly great composers can. And you said, I think you said, if I'm remembering the conversation correctly, that you didn't think that there were examples where it goes the other way around. And I think it would be fascinating to hear um, a little bit more from you about why not? Why, why only in one direction? Um, first, I need to answer uh, your question about, um, no, the statement about the development. Mm. Uh, 
The problem with me, uh, uh, with what you assume, is that you assume that there is a method. That, okay, we've got something that is good or is great or, or whatever uh, to start with, and I am a great composer, so I know what I do from there. But I don't. No. no. I really don't, and I don't think that anyone, no one knows. Mm. It's because each seed is a different seed, and it has a different world, so in that sense, it, it has all the rules of developing, uh, uh, and it's uh, d actually when you uh, when we talked this afternoon, we didn't go into that direction uh, because I didn't pick on that and um, about sort of whether sort of better than when the work was not a great work had done a good job in developing it. Mm. Maybe he hasn't. Mm. Maybe sort of if the seed is rotten, you can't develop it. Yeah. That yeah. it's just not going to, like, like a seed. But if it's dead, it's just not going to do anything. And it doesn't depend on how well you are going to try to develop it. You can't. Mm. Maybe, uh, but uh, I've not thought about that <laughs> problem. So I'm not sure. But um, um, maybe because sort of we are starting to, to go into all sorts of directions, we should do another example mm -hmm. uh, of, of, uh, of playing. Because sort of my idea was that we are going to do uh, basically three uh, type of examples that will be quite short um, that gives us um, a few facts. And from this fact, uh, well, people have to have the facts and they can disagree on, the f uh, on what, how you analyze them, but you have to have a few facts so that we can start to ask questions. Um, so the, the, the second part, uh, we are going to, to, to hear uh, the piece from where we, um, we stopped uh, until a place where when I arrived there, I thought, what's coming next? So that's falsy. <laughs> next. <laughs> so, uh, so now when I arrived there, it's a, the main uh, problem for all art in general is basically to avoid boredom. Uh, so my role is to avoid any note that is not interesting. Uh, and the, my friend in that is a little friend called Contrast. And uh, I try to create contrast both at the same time and also through time. So when we arrived there, I say, okay, I arrived at a point of something is going to happen next, but what should happen next? So to know what should happen next, I think about what I've got and I try to imagine a contrast to that. So um, if you um, play maybe that example, but the last three bars of that, just the last three bars of. No, 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 <laughs> no, that was not that one. So, so, uh, um, so, for, so, so that beat, for me, the beat that was before came from being pretty dramatic to melancholic, sad, on wondering what's coming next, but in a sad, melancholic manner. So something else that would be slow and sad wouldn't be a contrast, so it would be more of the same and we'll be a bit bored of it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do something that is light and peaceful. And that's what I come up with. So if you play all that uh, example, five, eight. And then 
I'm not entirely convinced. And I try to imagine in my head the piece from the beginning to listen to it, to listen to it. And maybe, uh, uh, Clélia, could you play the first bar of the piece, or first two bars of the piece? Stop. And then could you play the example 5A from the new bits? So bar three of the... No, no, after, two bars after that. So I think, okay, it's new, but you are coming back to the same thing. It's basically other notes, but to say the same. So it's not enough, a contrast. It might be a contrast with what comes immediately before, but we've seen it before, and even if you don't remember because you've got short memory, somehow we feel that we know that person. So not good. So I think, okay, it was sad, now it's happy. It's a bit more fairy-like. What makes it similar? Speed. So I decide to do something different with speed. So that's example 5B. And that I'm happy because it's really different. Um, and so um, we've got other examples of uh, change, what you could call um, change of mood of the same person. So if you know, like, uh, we are each individuals, but you can't say that, uh, I mean, I don't know anyone that is happy every day or is, well, you can feel, find people that are sad every day, but not for a long time, hopefully. Uh, so it's how you change the motives. Um, but that will bring us to the third um, problem of context. Uh, and so I'll take more questions from Adrian now. <laughs> well, um, of course, there is that issue about the third question and, and context and, and how that fits into the idea of the absolute. Actually, maybe, I mean, there's another whole direction that I'd like to go into later, but maybe you could say something straight away about, about that, about that third element in this process and fitting things to their context. So, so maybe then, then we, let's play the last examples okay. because it will make, and then we can always add other examples okay. after, yeah. and I can ask you any part. Mm. <laughs> Poor Clelia, I just told her, you know, we are going to do all the examples that are the bits that I didn't use. And after that, sort of if someone asks a question in the audience, I'll just tell you, play bar 30. And she looked at me <laughs> very scared. <laughs> so. <laughs> But she's really good, so she can do it. So, but now, so let's take this um, this problem of uh, same person, different mood. So uh, uh, it's um, the bit that uh, I told you just earlier that I tried to do after the that was after I, there was a pause and we wanted to know what's coming next. I tried something and I said, "Oh, it's a bit." Too much of the same. So if we, uh, we if you play the, the first line of example 5C. <coughs> so to do a contrast or to do make, make something different, first you need to understand the essence of it. So I ask myself the question because it's not like, even if I've been composing forever, um, it's never a trick. So you, I, you have to ask yourself a question, sort of what really it is. It's a bit like a detective work. Uh, and, uh, and I say, okay, so what makes it this, what, let's, let's call that this bit is called Sylvia. So what makes Sylvia, Sylvia? Well, she's very light, she's not stressed. She's got a high pitched voice, um, she's pretty. Um, and in terms of music, it's, uh, it's dreamy. It's very high the sound. So if I want to change it, I want to make it really dark and really low. <laughs> and Claire, do you want to play again the same melody up there?
I think that I prefer to live with the first girl than the second girl, but <laughs> that's a matter of choice. <laughs> um, so, but every person is boss. So, um, but anyway, so, 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 the interesting thing is that, um, is what I was saying to, to Adrian before, um, it's a problem of right time, right place. Yeah, I was telling him also about sort of when we were young and oh, we are still young. And um, and you, you, I went to, uh, to ask a girl out and she said, oh, it's not really the right time, the right place. Maybe another time it would have worked. Mm -hmm. And you think, is there a right place and a right time for love or for anything? Or is it, does it depend on context? So. This Sylvia that we've heard, I was not pleased at all about her in the place that she was because it was very similar to the beginning. But now that I've changed her into a sort of really moody and dramatic creature, could she fit somewhere else? And that's what's interesting. Sort of, so we've heard what I've done to, um, to after the, the, the little break, and there was this fast bit. But the dark Sylvia can fit after that. So now let's hear sort of the bit that was the ending of the, the question. Then you have the fast bit that I was happy with. And after that, we've got the sad bit. And for me, it fits there. And w what is interesting is that sort of, there are a lot of things that, um, as a composer, uh, once I did a lecture with a scientist uh, um, uh, about uh, composing on the scientific method, uh, because it's, um, the process of composing itself is very much like the scientific method. Like I showed you, sort of, you do something, and if you really don't like it, you think, okay, why don't li I like it? Is it the rhythm? Is it the speed? Is it the wrong note? Is it? And then you try to change one of the things, but one, if possible, so that you can figure out what it is. Um, but a lot of the of the mystery, and maybe the, what makes it fascinating, is that the answers to that are often instinctive, uh, and, but you wouldn't get them if you do not ask the right question, but somehow you come, you don't do it, it, it comes like re a revelation rather than sort of uh, a calculation of, uh, of a math problem. It, it, and, it's, uh, and for me, uh, having just sort of heard now the, the bit uh, in context, I think, so why does suddenly that works? that very dark, slow beat after the fast beat. And my intellectual work, uh, mind, uh, musical work, mind works. And I think because actually the fast beat was already her. It had something in common that introduced her. It was fast, but it had some common notes. So in a way you are introduced to these new characters before, and that's why it makes sense. It's on, on that sort of after, uh, for me, uh, sort of, um, Creation is about uh, finding the only uh, right way, but the only right way in terms of, you could say, psychology. And it's why uh, my father, that is an artist, I remember when, when, we were, uh, when I was quite young, he said that he thought that uh, the person that described the best um, what, it, uh, what was uh, the artistic process was not a philosopher, but was Freud because he thought about the creation of tension on release. Uh, and for me, it's, uh, it's, um, it's finding the, the only way that feels natural, but in the same way that possibly sort of if you were writing novels and you had a character that you don't want to, this character to do something that this character would just never do. You build up a character that uh, does something in the first 150 pages and 
you, you, you feel that you know that character and suddenly this character takes a machine gun and kills everybody and you think the writer is no, not really, it's not working. And, and it's in that sense, but music is abstract, it's just notes, but somehow, so I've got, when it's not right, I feel it. And um, the difference between sort of uh, uh, people that do and people that listen is that I need to find what to do instead. But it's like sort of when you go to a concert, oh, uh, often sort of the audience is a lot more right than the critics about if the people played well or not. Because the audience just feel if it's right or not. They might not know why it's right, or but the feeling is right. The problem is to be able to do it right. Because everybody can feel that it's not right because you don't take a machine gun when you're normal and go and kill everybody. Yes. Well, what Nimrod has, has, has just said brings me to what for me personally is the, one of the most interesting questions of all in this area. Um, and Nimrod just talked about some of the uh, similarities and differences between the process of musical composition and, and the sorts of processes that are involved in establishing a scientific theory, the, the analogies and disanalogies between the arts and the sciences. Um, and that brings me to what I think is a, is a really fascinating and fundamental question in this whole area, which is whether at the end of the, of the day there's the following really fundamental difference between the arts and the sciences, namely that in the case of the arts, even if it's appropriate to talk about the absolute in the way that you have been doing, even if that language is somehow appropriate, nevertheless, at some very basic level, there's a kind of relativization to the human. You know, is there something anthropocentric at work in the arts in a way that there isn't in the sciences? It's a genuine question. I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, putting this as a rhetorical question, uh, this is not meant to imply that I think the answer is yes, although I do think the answer is yes, <laughs> but, it, but it's a genuine question and it's a difficult question. Um, but you talked, you talked about boredom, you talked about moods, you, you, you named pieces of the music with human names. Um, all that talk of mood and boredom and such like makes me think that we're surely talking about something that at some level is tapping the human condition and might not be resonating in the same way with Martians, for example. I mean, it's a crazy thought experiment, I know, but I, I have this vision of these little green men or little green women or little green Martians or whatever they are getting out of their spaceship. Um, they're technologically sophisticated. They're technologically sophisticated enough that they have a spaceship that, that's got them here in the first place. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if it turned out that once we'd gone in for mutual translation and all of that, we found that their science was fundamentally the same as ours. I mean, we, we might have things that we can teach them. They might have things that they can teach us. But you can imagine that, broadly speaking, we're doing physics in the same way. Whereas it seems to me that even if they've got ears, I mean, that's a big if in the first place, but even if they've got similar sensory faculties to ours, absolutely no reason to suppose that if you play them Beethoven, it'll mean anything at all to them. <laughs> You know, they might react to it as an unlovely cacophony of sheer noise. And then when they um, present us with the sort of music that moves them, the same is true in reverse. Um, it's, as I say, it's a, it's a thought experiment. You might think it's a ridiculous thought experiment. But I, I suspect um, that you're going to want to say, Nimrod, that no, 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 it's, it's more absolute than that. Is that right? Yes, but I'm going to defend myself. Okay. <laughs> On to attack. Right. The best line of defense is attack. <laughs> First, when did you hear, hear great belief in science that have changed? So let's say something that Newton, who was a great scientist, thought and then discovered that it's not right. Mm -hmm. Have you heard something that got better than Beethoven? Not really. So in that sense, Beethoven is more absolute than Newton. 
because it doesn't get better. It doesn't change. It's not going to get better because it's perfect. Science is not creation. It's an understanding of what is there. So I would, uh, in, in a way, sort of, if I remember well, but yeah, I'm in dangerous territory, so I, I, uh, I, when I was young, when I was 11, I was on a holiday, and my grandma had books of Plato translated, not in Old Greek, uh, and I read it, and I fell in love, and I read all Plato that I could read, uh, and it was my, I became a very great friend with Socrates, very close friend, <laughs> and, um, and if I remember well, for Plato, there were two things that were very important. It was mathematics and music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that mathematics is, in that sense, like music and not like science, because it creates something that is absolute in the sense that, because it's a construction, it's not going to be, well, it could, if it's wrong, be proven wrong after, but whether science, if it's a physical science or biology, or, or even sort of, you know, sort of doctors, they say, well, you should not eat eggs. And then now they say you should eat more eggs or careful with your sugar. And then maybe in, in two, two years, they'll discover that actually sugar is good for you. So these things changes mm -hmm. better than doesn't. But, uh, <laughs> but to answer the second question about the Martian, uh, I think that you, um, my explanation like on the psychological level, you, the way that you try to um, eliminate aspect of things are not the things, the thing itself. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm not a philosopher, and I'm a, I'm a composer, so that's what I'm good at, but not the philosophy uh, or, or, or even the explanation. But I think that there is a limit. Uh, Mendelssohn once said, when he was young, he was, a, he was a, one of the most amazing child prodigies. They are not, we always think about Mozart, but, uh, but Mendelssohn and Schubert were younger when they wrote their great works. Uh, and, and it's not surprising because if you read the letters, uh, that he wrote, and I don't mean music, letters written to his parents when he was 11. He was a very clever man. And, uh, and in one of his letters that I read, he said that if um, he could express his, uh, his music in words, he wouldn't compose. And then he develops the idea and that I think uh, myself that there are thousand ways that you can be sad, but there's only a few words to describe sadness. With, uh, uh, but in music, you can describe every single possibility of sadness that we have or that we could have. Um, but so when I, 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 uh, I talk about, uh, um, I give examples like, uh, uh, or I make jokes, it's just to, to try to eliminate something that, that is over understanding. Uh, but, and I think that, that, uh, that what, uh, it's like, uh, I come back to, to Freud, there is a conscious and the unconscious. Uh, and I think there is an, um, our brain is very developed and he, uh, it analyzes things that you are not aware that it does in the unconscious. And so the complex structures uh, uh, that creates uh, our pleasures and uh, that I think that what, what gives us the highest pressure is actually intellectual uh, and non-sensorial. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, it goes through, uh, the, the, uh, so, so through the ear. Uh, if it's music, if it was painting, it, was, it would be through, uh, through the visual art. But I always say that my, my father, who is an artist, was my b bigger teacher because the, in the essence, it's exactly the same what you're trying to do. Uh, and it's why I think that the Martian, given that he was clever, would enjoy it. And, and, and I, I need a bigger audience, so he's welcome. <laughs> I, I think on this note, uh, we should open the debate to the public and uh, see how the Mar Martians will fare with you, okay? <laughs> what would be your response to the topics uh, that uh, Adrian and Nimrod uh, discussed? So, Yes, please. Uh, if you could uh, wait for the microphone, that would be super. Thank you. Thank you. Nasser Kalawun. Um, 
When I take my children, who are, since they were 11, to theater, uh, to ballet and opera, um, I try to lean on them to read reviews of music, or, and they played, one of them played violin and the other one uh, a flute. To read the reviews, not to be uh, too abstract for them to fall bored, uh, feel bored. But uh, their view is, if we read it before, we get uh, not to be surprised with it, so we'll feel bored. So this view is uh, matured over the years. What is your perception, uh, perception of this? Since they are still going to theater, but they rely on, like, I'm going to fall in love with it or not love, uh, fall with it, and not to read reviews till after I've seen it, to see if I am right or wrong, it depends what, what people say. Well, how, you're asking, how do you stand? You are, you're asking a composer, so my sort of gut feeling would say don't read reviews before or after. But, uh, <laughs> but if I want to be fair, because there is a chance that there may be an interesting review, um, personally, I think that there's no point to read a review before you heard the piece. Because you shouldn't take things for granted in life. You should question everybody's assumption. So how can you question it if you don't know even what they are talking about? Uh, so I would, um, we, we have a big advantage, sort of, um, always there's been sort of this question of, um, of science on moral, uh, the philosophical question from the beginning of the world, sort of if sort of the advance of, uh, of science are good or bad on the two aspects uh, of what you can do. Um, and I think that uh, in the sense of the internet or the computers, there are wonderful things. Uh, on these days, you can just go on YouTube and you listen to the piece. And then you read the review, and then maybe you go to the concert. But I think to read the review about, um, about a piece of music without having heard the piece of music is strange. It's a bit like sort of you are going to, to read a, a point of view about a meal, about something that you've never heard about the vegetable. You don't know what it's going to taste like, and maybe you're not going to like it. Thank you. Uh, Edwin, would you like? No? Okay, more questions, please? Here, uh, yes, and uh, lady at the front, please. Um, well, there, there's one at the back and one at, and you after, please, the lady here. Um, thank you very much for, for the music and for the expansion on the philosophy of things. Um, it always fascinates me how a musician decides to what, what um, prompts him to, to compose a new piece. Um, Could you speak I, up, please? Uh, I, it always um, fascinates me what prompts a musician to compose a new piece. For example, I draw, I can look at somebody's eyes and really I'm so taken by, by the combination of things that I decide to draw the portrait. Um, so that's my question to you. And my question to you is, um, what, what makes you as a philosopher to, um, the, 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 we question many things, and what makes you f decide to really go deep into a, a subject? Because personally, I do think about things a great deal, but I just find that I do not wish to go beyond a certain limit because it's, I, I think that's the point of madness. But for a philosopher, <laughs> it, and I think there have been philosophers, like Wittgenstein, uh, who, who did really, uh, he was really affected. So it would be great to have this opportunity to, to, to know a bit more. Thank you. Shall I go first? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that. Um, for me, the, the answers to the, the other questions, I think, I think are, are true for every great uh, composer. That, uh, but this one that you're asking, this precise question, I think it's a personal thing. Uh, that different uh, creators have different uh, aspirations uh, on reasons for doing things. In my case, uh, I decided to, uh, to, to be a composer, and I started to compose when I was six, and I decided that I wanted to be Beethoven, and that I wanted, it's not to compose because it's nice to compose, I wanted to do things that are great, that are beyond anything, uh, but not out of ego, 
uh, it's it's not, it's difficult to um, to differentiate the two things. It's a uh, it's a love of beauty, but a beauty that is doesn't exist yet uh, above anything else at the peril of anything else and. Uh, and that's always been that. So before I, I compose another piece, my main thing, which is very boring, I think it must be great. It must be something out of this world. Because I think that um, if, uh, I don't know how a, a psychologist would, would uh, analyze that, but I think that in, uh, as humans, we are imperfect. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great relief to, uh, to live in a world of perfection. And when you, um, you create, for, for me, it's, um, it's a special place that doesn't exist in the, it, well, it exists in the w real world when you are there, uh, but it's, uh, um, it, it's in that sense that, uh, to, to come back to, to Adrian's question about what was the absolute, I, uh, absolute and perfection on, on all these, uh, the, the, these words that are not exactly synonymous. Uh, for me, the absolute is not necessarily perfect, but uh, maybe is perfect in its imperfection. Uh, and take us um, in a, um, in a, in a world that is um, of pure uh, abstraction. I think there are some connections, actually. Uh, I mean, you asked what prompts somebody to be a, a philosopher, and I think in very many cases there is a similar sort of craving for the absolute, actually. Um, and insofar as it's not attainable, um, a, a, a craving to understand why not. But another important connection, and what I'm about to say is going to sound facetious, and I don't mean it facetiously, I mean it seriously. But another connection, uh, Nimrod said that he um, uh, started to compose at the age of six, and I think I started to philosophize at the age of six. And, and the, the comment that I'm about to make that will sound facetious is this. I actually do think that philosophers are people that have never really grown up. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a fundamentally... Um, childlike a, a approach to reality. You know that, that really tiresome thing when little children constantly ask the question why and no answer satisfies them. You, I mean, you, you, um, you, you, you can address the question and at one level you can tell them why, but immediately your answer is met with another why. And I think philosophers are a little bit like that. I think we're people that haven't quite grown up, haven't quite come to terms with with reality in the way that um, uh, s small children are trying to come to terms with reality. Um, you, I mean, you, you, you talked about the connection between philosophy and madness. Well, it's, a, it's an ever-present danger. And I think most of us would say that we have to try and confine it. I mean, if you were really thinking philosophically all the time and at the deepest possible level, it would drive you crazy. Um, the, the philosopher David Hume made this point very well. I can't remember the exact quotation, but there's a, there is a famous quotation where he talked about the, um, the way in which his scepticism was very troubling to him and then commented on the fact that um, when he's been in the study for a long time thinking about these abstract philosophical questions and when it's been driving him crazy he then goes and dines with his friends and plays a game of backgammon and and it's soon all forgotten um and and it and it better had be otherwise it will drive you crazy uh, there's a lady at the front I first oh, sorry, oh, sorry. i said that i should maybe add something to the question before that was uh, about reading or not reading <laughs> um, um, the critics. Mm. Uh, I think that in our society, uh, we don't um, we don't question enough. We are very, very. We are in an age where we think that we are very, very revolutionary, and we are moving fast. 
Uh, but in terms of pure thinking, we've never been so slow. I was talking to that to, to Adrian before that uh, if you think sort of the space of time between Monteverdi, Bach, Mozart, and the gap that he, he did in, in terms of even sort of you take Mozart and then Beethoven and Schubert, it's a few years, totally different world. You take Varese, hundred years ago, and you go to a concert of a little bit boring uh, usual contemporary music, and it. Well, it's a little not here and there, but it's almost the same thinking, so it's not moved very much. But for the same reason, I think that we assume too much that um, we separate um, feeling and thinking, and they are not two different things. Um, it means that for your children, sort of for, for, for example, for my dad, uh, if uh, I, I remember sort of who, if I disliked something, sort of, I, I thought it was not good, uh, he would ask me to justify it. So uh, there are some reasons why I don't find the music of Boulez interesting. It's not because I don't like it. I don't dislike it. I don't find it interesting. Uh, and I think that it's important in children to, um, to use this way of thinking that is actually like in philosophy that you don't uh, just treat art as something that you feel. Do I feel that I like this music? Do I like it? Because things change a sort of, there is a part of being able to see. So let's say that um, if, you, if you were hearing, um, I don't know, if I was personally hearing a poem by Heine, I wouldn't find it beautiful at all, but I don't speak German. So there is a problem that first you need to know what is in there, not according to what a little book will tell you that actually the, the author wanted to do that, because no, who knows what the author wanted to do that, but just that you actually can hear what is in there, and then you can form your own opinion, and you can debate whether it's right that I have discussed hundreds of hours with my dad about uh, things saying this is rubbish and he said no it's not rubbish you are not intelligent enough you don't that's too easy and, uh, and I had to motivate my judgment why I didn't think it was good or why I thought it was good if it was not good enough and I think that it's uh, it's where all the um, the disciplines that are uh, have in common the, the search of uh, not so absolute, but uh, the intellect have in common, whether it's uh, philosophy, literature, painting, music, uh, or, or science, is that they don't take things for granted, mm. uh, and mm. we can stay young, like said Adrian. Yes. Yes. Okay, the lady at the front, please. Um, the Can, you, uh, the Sorry. Can you hear? Yes. Thank you very much for a very beautiful music and very interesting uh, topic. Um, the word abstract for me has something static about it and maybe it's just my misinterpretation but I see possibly um, a dialectic between uh, the absolute which um, for me can be related to the infinite and for me the infinite has an idea of dynamism so I don't know how to reconcile absolute and infinite. And um, to come back to the seed, I think the idea of the seed is full of dynamism and hence for full of infinite. I mean, you can possibly envisage that a seed has infinite mathematical possibilities of uh, interfering uh, aspects and elements and rhythm and notes and so on. So um, I wonder if the word absolute is absolutely, <laughs> sorry. So first, um, sorry, I'm going to, to, to escape a little bit <laughs> the discussion, let it Adrian uh, answer, but um, before we came when we were walking, um, I said to Adrian uh, about process of composing uh, on uh, on sort of whether sort of it was sort of like sort of you do the you have a plan do you have a, 
a plan or not. So let's say if I compose a piece that is 10 minutes long and before I start, I say, okay, there's going to be three minutes of that and then two minutes of that. And do I have a rough plan of where I'm going? My, uh, my personal answer to that is no. Um, but, uh, but always, all performers and everybody say that my music is super structured. But it's not the structure in the idea that you, you're going to, to, to have the structure and then you try to fit the things by force and you push them and you get them in. Um, it's, a, it's an idea of it's only the right notes that could be there. But uh, I was, uh, I, it's, I'm not sort of uh, going to a different tangent. I'm just um, to explain that the, di the difference is uh, when you are at the beginning of the piece, you've got the first 10 seconds of the piece and you've got to imagine what's going to come in the next five seconds. So you've got in your mind to condense this 10 seconds into the instant of the essence of what it is. As I go, like for the moment I'm uh, writing a cello concerto, and you've done, let's say, 10 minutes of music, when I start to work on a, uh, on a piece where I've already composed 10 minutes of music, I need nearly an hour to be able, to, in my mind, when I start the next day, to condense this 10 minutes into like a second. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like these 10 minutes were just one object. And so it's like doing the Big Bang in the opposite direction. So you compress the thing and you go back to the origin so that you feel what is that. And when it, you know what is that, then you can write the 11th minute and find the only 11th minute that it could be. So in a way, when you say the seed contains everything, it made me think about that because of the, like, the Big Bang, the origin, and then everything explodes and expands to infinity. For me, it's a process of composing is uh, a process that is almost inverse. I compress all the, the development of the infinity that goes everywhere and I try to go back to the Big Bang so that I can find what to do. So it is that um, microphone. Internal... Sorry. Could you call that internal necessity? And the word necessity is maybe less frozen than the word. Necessity. No, because internal necessity makes you think that it's got something to do with me, which I don't think it has. And I'm not a believer in God, but it's it's nothing to do with ego. It's nothing to do with me. I think that things are. It's and it's why sort of when I had the chance to do a lecture with Adrian, I, I took it because he wrote something about. The, uh, something, a point of view that without a point of view, I think that uh, that certain things are not relative, uh, and they just are. Uh, and it's uh, the fact that that I, it's I don't see any. When I, I listen to my music in concert or I listen to Beethoven, I don't feel attached to my music in a different way. It's not what is important for me is to create something that is beautiful. It's nothing to do with me. I don't. I'm not. Um, in that sense, I'm not a romantic. I don't try to express myself, but I think even it's a bit re reductive for the romantics because uh, they would not have agreed with that uh, anyway. But uh, it's, um, it's in that sense that I use the absolute because inner necessity, it's against too much of, oh, I feel that. Can uh, I, so, sorry to interrupt and, and, and for, forgive me if I'm, putting, saving me. <laughs> if I'm putting words into your mouth, but I don't, I don't think that's what you meant by the word inner, is it? When you talked about inner necessity, I don't think you were talking about the subjective, I think the, I, as it were, the logic of the, the inner logic of the yeah, thing. Yeah, I think I, I wanted to say internal, mm. not in, in, internal, N-A-L. Mm. So for me, I, I didn't see any... Sorry, I didn't see any um, relationship between uh, yourself, your ego, your subjectivity. Mm. I thought that internal necessity was very much related to the work itself, which was like, as you said, something separate. But you know, it's like sort of uh, when you have, uh, when the sum of the parts is something else. Yeah. The internal necessity is what makes, you, makes it possible to create the whole thing. And the whole thing is something else than the ad that's adding up of all the parts, and that's what I, uh, I think has got to have uh, an absolute. Because it's a part of all sorts of internal necessities of the work, but that somehow creates something else that, um, that you can't, that uh, 
it's a it's interesting that for, for, for me I can very very well understand why uh, some great composers like Bach were religious men because for me when I and I'm not, I'm completely atheistic, but when I finish a work, and it always left the feeling that I've not done it, that I've not composed it, that it's not me, yeah. that it's just finding something that sort of yeah. is there, uh, that's a cycle, but of course, I, I'm a rational man, so on the practical, the way to keep myself sane, <laughs> I'm not go mad, uh, I know that, no, I've done it, it's me, but, uh, but it doesn't feel like that. We have more, uh, 10 minutes left for I, quite a few can more I questions, just, but just, yes, well, please. Well, just very briefly, if I may, just pick up on the, uh, the aspect of the infinite, uh, which is a, a topic that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I, I think your question is absolutely fascinating. There's, there's far more to say than I'm going to be able to say in, in, in these brief moments. But I do think that there is... A, a real tension, a recurring tension that you see throughout the whole history of thought about the infinite and actually throughout the whole history of philosophy between um, the connotations of the absolute that go with this idea of infinity and connotations of the, of the temporal. I mean, you, you talked about the way in which um, it's natural to think of infinity in terms of a process, a, a, um, a, a sort of diachronic, never-ending process. And you find both aspects, and it's very interesting to relate it to what Nimrod was saying about the, the, the process of composition, where on the one hand you feel as if you have the idea captured all at once, and, and on the other hand you're somehow having to translate that into a um, a, a, a temporal phenomenon. I mean, whatever else it is, a piece of music is 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 a temporal object. Um, and and um, f for what it's worth, my, my my view is that the history of philosophy is, to a large extent, a history of trying to come to terms with that tension. And it may be that, in its own way, music is a way of trying to come to terms with that tension as well. So, more questions at the back, please. Yes. Hello. Um, I was very taken with the idea of um, the absolute answering something in the human condition, as though it, it must be. It speaks to something within us. Um, but I wanted to understand how much that absolute concerns the audience, the listener, and how taste plays into the absolute. Well, um, there's good taste and bad taste. <laughs> so, um, now I, I, I think it in form of, of a joke to start with, but it's very serious for me. It's, um, test is educated. Uh, so, we can go high or we can go low. Uh, the pool is towards the, the low. Uh, sort of like we don't float in the air, sort of the attraction is, is lower. But I think that um, that we my 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 mother used to be a, a professor of political science, and she and we often discussed uh, politics, and I love politics, uh, and um, as. Um, but I love politics as an interesting sort of, uh, it's like history in the moment. Uh, but she would always say about the danger of uh, the extreme on the absolutism in ideas, so that gives us the, the worst uh, example that we had in the 20th century of the fascism and the communism, where sort of there is not relativity. So ideas are absolute. Uh, but in art, without that, there is not great art. So, the, so when you got the Saint Just uh, in politics, uh, we are all in trouble. But if you don't get the Saint Just in art, we don't create anything good. Uh, it's, um, we, uh, and, uh, to come back to sort of why I, I went into politics, um, I think that human beings are not only craving for material things, uh, and um, they're craving for things that are more important than material things, 
uh, and I think that it was uh, uh, things that are abstract uh, and that are felt, and I think that, but that's my, my uh, uh, political analysis, that, uh, that Marx completely misread that, and that's why sort of the 20th century didn't go the way that he thought it would go, uh, because the pool of nationalism was far greater than the pool of money. Uh, and the irrational of what we think that we do that is not necessarily good for us, but that we feel that uh, it's true. Uh, and we can do horrible things if we start to believe that it's right. Uh, but it's more important. So, so, so music or, or the art are the healthy way in society to, um, to live with these ideas of absolute that in society destroy us. And in society, we need the relative things. We need uh, the, the negotiation. We need pragmatism. The, the pragmatism yes. Not, no, because I think that it's pragmatic as well. But we need to be more tolerant. But there's no tolerance in art because there's no tolerance. It's, it's come back to the beginning of the talk about creation. God is not tolerant. You need to have one vision. And then that vision will be good or bad, or not interesting, but it will be the only possibility to, to have a vision that is interesting, is to have a personal vision. Uh, would you like to add I'm, something? I'm, no, I'm happy to. Uh, so, Mark, uh, we have time for two or three more questions, please, but quickly. Yes, please, over there, yes. Oh, me? Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm short. Um, so, this question uh, might be uh, forcing both the both of you to defend both of your fields, so I'm sorry. Um, so uh, when I think of the absolute, I think of it as a transcendent ident uh, entity, right? And, and speaking of the absolute means you have to use symbols in order to construct an understanding of the absolute. So my question is whether or not you think music or language, philosophical language, does a better job of representing the absolute. Excellent question. Yes, Adrian. Yes. That, that's the topic for the next time that Absolutely. we get together. <laughs> we are planning another session. Definitely on, on the initial um, so, uh, Sorry, I mean, again, that's a, 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 a flippant response. But, but, but it's a fascinating question. And I, I really, I genuinely don't think that there's much that I can say that's useful and brief. But, but we have been toying with the possibility of another session, and I think if we if we do have another session, it would be addressing just that sort of question. And and um, of course, I mean the way that you put the question is, um, you know, is language or music better able to um, express the the transcendent? But but of course, lurking in the background is is the whole question of whether it can be expressed at all. Um, Perhaps the answer to the question is not that they're equally good, but that they're equally bad. <laughs> um, but, um, but actually, I don't think either of us think that. That would be something that we would agree on, that they're not equally bad. Yeah. I think that um, if I answer in my... Well, that's, that's not a philosophical answer, I think, but uh, it, it's a, the, the transcendental... Um, is a, a necessity uh, for human beings, uh, like uh, we just approached before. I think the difference between philosophy and uh, or um, on music or art is that the point of philosophy is to understand the transcendental, and maybe that's a quest that is never ending. The the art they don't try to to explain the transcendental; they try to to create it, to show it. When I, uh, one of the, the things that I always say, it's really easy to say why a piece of music uh, is not great. It's not good music, it's not great, or that piece is not good, I can say exactly why. On the great pieces of music, there are the pieces that you can't say why they are not good. They are not, not good, they are good everywhere, so they are good. It's on that sort of, that's a transcendental that you can never, um, you don't know, and I'm not, because I'm not a philosopher, I'm not um, that interested in finding the answer of why something is good or why um, something is transcendental. I'm interested in creating it. 
Uh, and of course, as a, as a layman, I'm very interested by the question, but I'm not interested to solve it for myself. I think there may be less difference between philosophy and music in that respect than you suggest. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more short question, perhaps? Oh, gosh. The gentleman here, yes? Um, oh. We've all been trying um, slightly different words to see how it sparks you off. I, I, lady asked about taste. I might, um, I might try a word like style. I mean, you, you've already commented on other great composers that you recognize as being great composers. And I think some of us would be able to listen to a piece of music and ascribe that music to a particular composer. I know you were saying a few minutes ago that having composed, and I understand what you mean, having composed, you feel you've created something which is separate from you, but I believe some people who knew your music might be able to identify it as being a piece of music that you may well have composed. I guess if one put three great artists, if one could, in front of the same individual and said, paint their faces, you would get three very different renditions of the same face, each one you might end up saying was an absolute Rembrandt or an absolute Lucian Freud or a, you would be able to say that they were perfect, absolute renditions by that artist. And I'm interested in this, this idea that you can create something that is absolute but not unique given a certain style. I think it's, um, uh, shall I answer sure, first? Yeah. That, um, there is this, um, I think it's because it's so difficult to explain when you don't live with an, uh, with an artist. People always think that uh, there is technique and then there is style. And sort of, it's, it's, it's funny, sort of people will tell you sort of, uh, of course, you, you went and studied composition and you, you learned how to do that and, and, and how it's done. No, it's, of course I did, but it's not, there are no tricks. It's, um, there are never any tricks. And in, t in terms of style, sort of there are... Styles depend, so greatness in, in, in that sense depends on truthfulness, I think. That um, if you are entirely true to yourself, as we are each uh, of us different, you will create something that is unique if you can, if you are, if it's not only because you are all unique, but you are not, for example, I can't write a book or I can't paint because that's not my field. Uh, and even if I spent 20 years, I, I still could not do that. I can do that in music. Uh, but um, for example, I, I think that there is far more in common with Beethoven and Bach and Stravinsky than, than there is with, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say, the, there is more in common between Bach and Chopin than between Chopin and Czerny. Because what makes great composer great has always been the same. It's that it's not predictable. It's not um, always the same. It's not boring, but it's not boring for, for you could, it's, you can really pinpoint why Chen is boring. It's difficult to do the other way around, uh, but it's, it's, it's a symmetry. So, so, uh, it's why sort of, uh, sort of w when people sort of uh, say to me, well, you, you've got to really open yourself to the world. Why don't you listen to pop music? I say, but it's, I don't really want to force you to watch the Teletubbies on the TV. So that, you know, sort of it's, uh, I did, uh, my, my, my daughter, she, she's studying, she's five, and she's studying the piano with me for a year, and things like that. she's playing well. She was very, uh, she's very interested in music. She was listening to, to Tchaikovsky, all sorts of things. And then she went to school. And she comes back from school with the great education. Suddenly, she discovered pop music. Uh, and so she listened to something unbearable on um, YouTube. And I, I said to her, well, it's not good. And I'm going to show you why it's not good, why it's boring, why sort of you're too intelligent to want to listen to that. So I said, OK. Um, 
So we listen to the thing and we say, okay, it's one bar plus one bar plus one bar plus one bar. They did a phrase of four bars. And then let's count how many bars for the next phrase. And one bar plus one bar plus one bar plus one bar. How many bars? Four bars. I say, let's count the next one. One bar plus one bar plus one bar for one bar. I said, four bars. I said, I say, so Alma, how many bars do you think for the next bit? And she sees a big smile. It's four bars. <laughs> and all pop music is like that. So pop music is like sort of Chani gone really, really wrong. <laughs> well, I think we might disagree on that, I suppose. That's for our next session, can I, next meeting. Can, but can Adrian, can I, just, please. Just, yeah. Sorry, just very briefly, if I may. Sorry, I know you want to uh, close this. But I, I just wanted to pick up on the phrase uh, being true to oneself, um, because I think this connects with your question. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase and a very apt phrase in this context because you've got both elements. I mean, there's the idea of truth, which connects with these notions of absoluteness that we've been talking about. But there's the personal element as well. Um, the, uh, uh, the thought that uh, two great composers may nevertheless have something intensely personal and, um, and individual uh, in their approach to their work, that there is this personal element um, that you find in art. Um, and I suppose, I mean, uh, the, the, the question that I raised earlier and the question that I keep wanting to come back to is whether at some very deep level um, art involves us, first person plural, being true to ourselves. That's, that's the question that, that, I, that I find myself constantly returning to in discussions of this kind. Thank you very much. So I think we should really thank uh, Adrian Nimrod and Clelia for their wonderful...